Right, Divinity Unveiled, part four. We're going to be covering the Ruach HaKodesh today, the spirit. Um, let's do a quick, very quick recap. In part one, we looked at the messenger of Elohim and the blurring between Elohim and the messenger. In the second half of that, we kind of looked at does Yah appear in bodily form and is there ancient record of that? Um, in part two, we covered the word and the identity of the word and how the ancient sages understood this. And we compared Targum and scripture to see some interesting things. Um, last week, I'm trying to think now. <laughs> we covered what, what the apostles believe. How did they consider Yeshua? And we looked at the apostolic writings and how they clearly elevated Yeshua to divine status, very clearly. And then in the second half of that, we looked at how um, even in the ancient Jewish mindset, they were waiting for a divine Messiah. This whole thing that Messiah will be just a man and that the prophecies regarding, say, Isaiah 53 were about Israel is a relatively modern phenomenon. We looked at even... Um, extra scriptural Jewish writings that showed that they understood Isaiah 53 as of the Messiah that would bear sin upon himself and die because of it in the process um, so yeah let, let's look at the spirit because we've kind of covered in the, in the sort of Godhead thing we've done Father Son really that's what we've done we, let, let's hit the spirit because this, there's all sorts of wonky doctrine in regards to the spirit so let's actually see what scripture says about the spirit and let hopefully give a more grounded view of the spirit so, so yeah we've covered how Elohim manifests himself to his creation in bodily form through his word and that it was Elohim it wasn't some other person running around Elohim also manifests himself and operates via his spirit you know, scripture is very clear on that. Like what we did with the word, we will look at the Tanakh to see how the Hebrews understood, understood the concept of the Ruach. Only with this foundation can we look at the Ruach in the apostolic writings, right? Everything needs to be on the, on the rock, the rock being Torah and the prophets. So with that, let's get stuck in. In the beginning... Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And this earth came to be formless and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim was moving on the face of the waters. It's the first mention of the spirit. And it literally says, Ruach Elohim. It's the spirit of Elohim. So it's not some other entity running around, it's the spirit of Elohim. Like the words I'm speaking right now are the words of Michael, right? They're not some other entity running around. When I breathe, it's the breath of Michael. It's a bit, this is an ownership, belonging sort of thing. It's of him. Let's note this. Let's remember the meaning of the word ruach. It means wind and it means breath. The, that's what, in the Hebrew, that's what it means. In the Greek, you have pneuma, which is the exact same word. It means wind, breath. So the wind, the spirit, the breath of Elohim was moving on the face of the waters. Psalm 33, by the word of Yah, the heavens were made and all their host by the spirit of his mouth. I really like that verse. I really like it. It's equating the word to the spirit, if you've, not no, if you've noticed that. The, how, like, all their host by the spirit, the breath, the wind of his mouth. Gathering the waters of the sea together as a heap, laying up the deep in storehouses. The spirit came from Elohim's mouth, i.e. his breath. It's his breath, his wind, as he spoke. Elohim created by his spirit. It literally says, and all their host, by the spirit of his mouth. It was the creative force behind his act, right? Just as it is the spirit of Yah, it is the word of Yah. Please note. So 
We're going to see this later on in the teaching, but the word and the spirit are, are synonymous with one another, and they're both of Yah. They belong, they come forth from him. I like this in Job. By his spirit, he adorned the heavens, his hand whirled the fleeing serpent. Job corroborates what the psalmist is saying. By his spirit, he did these things. Now, we covered this when we were doing the word. Uh, who, who, who did the Targum say created everything? The word. Note how the word of Yah is the same as his spirit. What we have in verse 6 is actually classic Hebrew poetry. It's a, it, they, they do this a lot. They will say the same thing twice with different wording. So look, by the word of Yah, the heavens were made, clause A, and all the host by the spirit of his mouth, clause B. They're both one and the same. You'll see, when you understand this, you'll actually see it all over scripture. And, and I'm going to pull a few of these out as we go forward through the teaching. But essentially, the word of Yah and the spirit of his mouth are being used synonymously. The Targum also equates the word to the spirit. Let's look at some comparisons. This is Isaiah, as we have it in the scripture. Search from the book of Yah and read. Not one of these shall be missing. Not one shall be without a mate, for he has commanded my mouth, and his spirit shall gather them. The Targum says this. For by his word they shall be gathered together, and by his pleasure they shall be brought together. So the, the Targum, this is uh, the Targum of Jonathan ben Uziah. We covered this. This is not just some um, layabout hippie sort of guy preaching. I mean, this was a respected rabbinic person, highly respected. And he, they're, they're equating the spirit and his word together. Let's get more witnesses. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the master Yah has sent me and his spirit. So the Trinitarians will actually use this. See, you've got your two people there. You've got Yah sending and his spirit sending. Targum says this. Come ye near to my word... Hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, at the time when the nation separated themselves from fearing me, at that time I brought Abraham, your father, to my service. So here we see a little embellishment. The prophet says, and now the Lord God and his word have sent me. So the Targumist is saying, actually it's the word. The spirit, the word. Inter they're interchanging this. Now, Jonathan ben Uzio and Paul were of the same uh, discipleship stock, shall we say. They were from the same um, teaching family. They were from the school of Hillel. Because we, we, Paul says that his teacher was Gamliel. We know where Gamliel, he's like, he, he's quite high up in the, he was a student of Hillel, or another one down from Hillel. So Paul would have been, we, we've got to think, how were they thinking of these things? Let's have another witness. And they shall fear the name of Yah from the west and his esteem from the rising of the sun when he comes like a distressing stream which the spirit of Yah drives on. This is speaking of how Yah will basically punish his enemies if you read it in the context of the chapter. This is what the Targum says. They shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun when the oppressors shall come in like an inundation of the river Euphrates. They shall be broken by the word of the Lord. The spirit and the word in the first century are being equated to one and the same thing. Now let's remember that the Targum and what Jonathan ben Uthiel spoke was considered inspired much how we consider the apostolic writings to be inspired, right? The word and the spirit are equated interchangeably almost. In the Hebrew mindset, these things are synonymous, as we've just seen. There's plenty more examples, by the way. Plenty more examples. This is much how, like Yah's presence, his word and the messenger of Yah are all synonymous. Do you remember when we covered the incident with Hagar? 
in, I think we did this in part one or part two, and how Hagar says, I have been, uh, you are El who sees, and I have been in your presence. And we know it was the messenger of Yah, but the Targum says it was the word and the Shekhinah, his, his manifested glory. Even the apostolic writers and our Messiah equate the word and the spirit as being the same thing, which is really interesting. In John 6, this is Yeshua speaking, it is the spirit that gives life, the flesh does not spirit profit at all, the words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. Now what words was Yeshua speaking? Those of the Father. I only do, I only say what the Father tells me. He's saying his words are spirit and life. Acts chapter 7. Let, let's look at how does the spirit and the word and all that bring life. Stephen tells us this. He's about to get stoned. He's given this great oratory to the Sanhedrin. He says, this is the Moshe who said to the children of Israel, Yah, your Elohim, shall raise up a prophet like me from your brothers. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the messenger who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living words to give us. The words that were spoken on... First, let's know who spoke them according to Stephen, the messenger. Go read the Exodus account. Who's speaking? Yah himself. So Stephen is equating that to the messenger. But look, the living words. Why are they living words? Because they bring life. The spirit, the words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. In Ephesians 6, because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim so that you have power to withstand in the wicked day and having done all to stand. Stand then, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having fitted your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace, above all, having taken up the shield of belief with which you shall have power to quench all the burning arrows of the wicked one. Take also the helmet of deliverance of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of Elohim. Paul is equating the word and the spirit. The sword of the spirit. Again, Yeshua said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. Praying at all times with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. People say, oh, what does it mean to pray and to prophesy in the spirit? And you get all sorts of wonky stuff, right? Let's keep, what has Paul just said? Praying in the spirit, in the word, in the confines of Yah's word. And as we're going to see later on, in his nature, what it means to be Yah, we're going to see the spirit is his nature, who he is. O oh, Yah, how many have you been your works? You have made all of them in wisdom. See, this is interesting. We covered this in the, in the Targums. It says, in wisdom Yah created if you look at the Targum of Genesis 1, the psalmist agrees with this. The earth is filled with your possessions. There is the sea, great and wide, in which are innumerable swarms, living creatures, small with great. So keep, this is going to be speaking about these living creatures. Bear that in your mind. There do ships go, that Leviathan which you made to play there. All of them wait for you to give their food in due season. You give to them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are alarmed. You take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. The word there is ruach. You take away their spirit. You'll find two words translated as breath. Ruach and neshama. We're going to cover a scripture that has them both soon. You send forth your spirit... They are created. You renew the face of the earth. Again, the spirit brings life. It's the creative force through which he brings life. How did Yah create man? He fashioned him, right? And what did he do after that? He breathed into him. And we've just, we saw it earlier, the breath. He, by his breath, by his word, by his spirit. 
Living creatures live because of the spirit that is given to them. It's the powerhouse of what you are. It's what makes you alive. His spirit. The sending forth of his spirit creates life. Job agrees. The spirit of El has made me. And the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Classic Hebrew poetry. The spirit, the Ruach of El, has made me in the Neshama. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. He's saying the same thing twice. You'll, you'll find these over. And it's a way that... Um, it's, the, it's a, when the Hebrews want to punch like something in. Like, you need to get this. This is why they repeat it twice. But with different wording. So far, the Spirit seems to be the creative force of Elohim. Nothing, you know... Let, let's just take it as it is. Note, again, yeah, I've pointed out the Hebrew poetry, the spirit of El, the breath of the Almighty. The word ruach also means one's nature, and I've put here the seat of emotions. Um, in the sense, we, we, we do this in modern day, that person is really mean-spirited. You know, it's your disposition, your character. Let's look at how scripture talks of this. Then Pharaoh awoke and saw it was a dream. And it came to be in the morning that his spirit was moved. The ruach, his ruach was moved. And he sent and called for all the magicians of Mitzrayim and all its wise men. So what, has he got this person inside of him that's moving him? No, his, something inside, we, we say this, there's something inside me stirring, like my spirit is troubled or my, some things, in, and you can't put your finger on it. It's your ruach, it's your spirit being moved, being stirred. And the word was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. So Joseph's just related the dream to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says to his servants, could we find another like him, a man in whom is the spirit of Elohim? Why does Pharaoh say this? Because Joseph has just told him the meaning of his dream. He has the nature, the ability, the disposition of Elohim. In Daniel 5, O sovereign, the mo- this is Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar's son before uh, Assyria come in and take over from Babylon. The most high Elah gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a reign and greatness and preciousness and esteem. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was so strong as to act proudly. Again, Hebrew poetry style. His heart was lifted up and his spirit was so strong as to act proudly. He was put down from his throne of reign and they took his preciousness from him. Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O Elohim, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The word is ruach. Give me a disposition, a nature of being steadfast. We all pray this. Endurance. Do not, I love this, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your set apart spirit from me. This again, classic Hebrew poetry. Do not take me away from your presence and to do that you take away your spirit. So now to have the spirit or to be in the spirit is to be in his presence. Link this back to what Hagar said when she met with the messenger. She was in Yah's presence. The the word, the Shekhinah, and now the spirit is all being in his presence. Now, if the spirit is someone else, whose presence are you in? Not, anyway. I'm getting ahead of myself. But ask yourself that. Anyway, let's keep going. Restore to me the joy of your deliverance. Uphold me, noble spirit. For you do not desire slaughtering, or I will give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The slaughterings of Elohim are a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed. O Elohim, these you do not despise. Again, a broken spirit, a heart broken and crushed. These are being equated. It's your heart, your... I don't want to say your soul, but it's... Your seat of emotions, your reasoning, your nature, who you are. Does that make sense? Proverbs 16, to man belongs the preparations of the heart, but from Yah is the answer of the tongue. 
All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but Yah weighs the spirits. This is this idea of judgment. You know, like, this is why you, you, you can't judge, because you don't know what's going on inside a, a man, right? But please note, to man belongs the preparation of heart, Yah weighs the spirits. What's Yah weighing? You. He, it's this idea of the scales, right? And he's weighing you. The preparation of the heart. You prepare yourself. He then sees what's there. That should put the fear of Yah in all of us. The spirit also empowered people to do incredible things. Throughout scripture. So, so far we've got the creative force. It's your nature, intrinsic nature, both of man and of Yah. See, I have called by name Betzalel, son of Uri, son of Hor, of the tribe of Yehuda, And I have filled him with the spirit of Elohim in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all work. Again, whose spirit is it? It's the spirit of Elohim. And this empowered him to build the tabernacle. So the woman, this is uh, Samson's parents. So the woman bore a son and called his name Shimshon. And the child grew and Yah blessed him. And the spirit of Yah began to move him at Machanedan and between Tzorah and Eshtaol. Now go read the, sp- the story of Samson. Every time that he, he was struck, it was the spirit that moved him. It was because he had the spirit that he had his supernatural strength. It empowered him. You know you get, um, when you see pictures and storybooks of Samson, and you see this great big massive body, I think he was just a normal guy. This is my personal little thing. I think he just looked like you and I. And because of the spirit, <laughs> you know, that, that would be a witness, right? The spirit also enabled people to prophesy and to speak the mind of Elohim. Right, he spoke through his spirit. You'll find that all the prophets in Judges and in Chronicles and Kings, they had it was through the spirit. Let's look at it. It is one of the ways by which he communicates with his creation. Right, we can attest to this in our personal walk. Then Yah said to Moshe, Gather me seventy men of the elders of Yisrael, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, and let them stand there with you. And I shall come down and speak with you there, and shall take of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, so that you do not bear it yourself alone. And it came to be when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied but did not continue. Now, what was Moses' role, actually? The people would come to him, right, saying, look, we've got a dilemma here. Tell us what to do. So what did Moshe do? According to Torah, he judged. He made a judgment. And by extension, he's putting Yah's will here on earth, right? This is what Yah says you should do in this situation. And he did that. The Spirit empowered him to do that. However, the two men had remained in the camp. Uh, The name of one was Eldad and the name of the other was Medad. And the Spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those listed but did not go out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. So the Spirit enabled people to prophesy. I don't want to get into a whole thing of what prophecy is, but... Nah, another time. (laughs) Then Moshe said to him, Are you jealous for my sake, O oh, that all the people of Yah were prophets, and that Yah would put his spirit upon them? Again, is this a, a magical Im, like, empowerment from someone else? Who's doing this? Is it another person? No, it's Yah doing this. Yah says, I will take some of that spirit and put it on you, and put it on them. Let's look at 1 Samuel 10. And Shemuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head. This is talking of Shaul, King Saul. And kissed him and said, Is it not because Yah has anointed you leader over his inheritance? And the spirit of Yah... So Saul says, How will I know this is true? And Samuel says, By these signs. 
The spirit of Yah shall come upon you and you shall prophesy with them and be turned into another man. He, there was the, he would prophesy with the school of prophets. He wasn't doing this by himself. In 2 Samuel 23, I love this. These are the last words of David, the saying of David, son of Yishai, the saying of the man raised up on high, the anointed of the Elohim of Yaakov and the sweet singer of Yisrael. By the way, the word anointed there is Mashiach. (laughs) The spirit of Yah has spoken through me and his word is on my tongue. Hebrew poetry again. He's saying the same thing. The spirit of Yah has spoken through me, his word is on my tongue. Again, note the Hebrew poetry. They're being equated. Was there another person running around in David? I'd like to think not, because now we're getting into our borderline possession, right? Or was the spirit the means by which Yah spoke through him? When the prophets were under the influence of the spirit, was it some other being? No, they knew it was the spirit of Elohim. It was his creative force, his nature, his power working through them. Let's remember that the word and the spirit are synonymous in the ancient Hebrew mindset. His word, the spirit spoke the word of Yah. Just as the spirit is the means by which Elohim can speak to his creation, I would argue the word is the means by which he can take on humanity. Like when, what we did with the word, when the word put on flesh, right? Does that make sense? By the, if the spirit is the means by which Yah can do all this, like make men prophesy, create life, do all this amazing stuff... The word is the means by which he can interact with you and I as well, on a different level, so so to speak. The spirit is also the means by which we can begin to change our nature into his nature and renew our mind. Remember, it can be your seat of emotions, who you are, your intrinsic nature. So if you have the spirit of Yah within you, you should start walking and acting and talking like him, right? Well, this is actually part of the renewed covenant. Let's read this. For this is the covenant I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts. And I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. So the Torah is being written on our hearts, which means we start walking in a way pleasing to him. How is this done? I shall give them one heart and put a new spirit within you. And I shall take out the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. It's the spirit that writes this on our hearts. So that they walk in my laws and guard my right rulings and shall do them. And they shall be my people and I shall be the Elohim. That spirit turns, this is what it means to walk in the spirit, right? That spirit should be changing you from what you are into what he is. Or to what he desires you to be. And I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I shall take out the heart of stone of your flesh and shall give you a heart of flesh. And put my spirit with... Oh, I've just repeated that. <laughs> it's meant to be the other Ezekiel one. There's another one. <laughs> Hang on. Yeah. It's in Ezekiel 36 or something. Created me a clean heart, O Elohim, and renew a steadfast spirit in in me and then he says don't take your spirit away from me why I want to be like you father I want to be pleasing in your eyes do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your set apart spirit from me Galatians 5 Paul picks up on this for you brothers having been called to freedom only do not use freedom as an occasion for the flesh but through love serve one another for the entire Torah is completed in one word in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself and if you bite and devour one another beware lest you be consumed by one another and I say walk in the spirit and you shall not accomplish the lust of the flesh So again, what have we said? Yeshua said, my words are spirit. 
Stephen was saying that the messenger brought the living words. The Spirit writes his Torah on our hearts. Walk in the Spirit, in the Word, in his nature, and you shall not accomplish the lust of the flesh. Not in this ethereal state of... Uh, I don't mean to mock, but anyway. For the flesh, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other, so that you do not do what you desire to do. Let's face it, we've, we know this struggle, right, as we try to walk out Torah. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under Torah. You're not under its penalty. You're not under its penalty. Why? Because you're walking in the spirit. It's not condemning you because you're not breaking it. And the works of the flesh, so what, what, look, the flesh, the spirit here is being contrasted. The works of the flesh are well known, which are adultery, whoring, uncleanness, indecency. Oh, look, all things that the Torah tells you are wrong. Idolatry, drug sorcery, hatred, quarrels, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, Envy, murders, drunkenness, wild parties, and the like of which I forewarn you, even as I also said before, that those who practice as these shall not inherit the reign of Elohim. <coughs> but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustworthiness. Also the opposite of envy, murders, drunkenness, right? Gentleness, self-control. Let's face it, we, self-control is what, or a lack of it, is what gets us in trouble. Against such, there is no Torah, there is no law. And those who are of Messiah have impaled the flesh with its passions and the desires. Paul's just told you what it means to walk in the spirit. It's not this ethereal mindset of I'm in, this, or this zone. As you'll hear this type of terminology. It doesn't mean become a spiritual antenna. <laughs> if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. He's just told you it means to not murder, to not fall in sexual sin, to not do adultery, to have patience, love. That's what it means to walk in the spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. All these things that Paul's saying, walk in the spirit, are pleasing to Elohim. It's his nature. It's who he is. By walking in the spirit, we imitate him. You know, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Messiah. So let, let, let's look at what we've covered so far. The spirit is the creative force of Elohim, right? It is the means by which he gets things done. Whether it be creating, whether it be speaking his mind through people in prophecy... In the Hebrew mindset, is parallel to his word. I mean, the Targum literally just says, instead of spirit, says his word. It is also one's nature, one's emotional center, which is paralleled with one's heart. We saw this. David says, create in me a new uh, uh, steadfast spirit and create in me a clean heart. It is the means by which he communicates to his creation. Look, we've, we can all attest that Yah has spoken to us, right, in one way, or has revealed things to us. It's not like he's like, hey, like big megaphone from heaven. No, he speaks through his spirit, which you have in you. Is there any reason or indication so far that the spirit is its own person? No. If we, if we look at it um, honestly... So far, all we get is it's the force or his essence. Uh, I, I, I like the phrase, the means by which. It's the means by which. One of the central theme of the good news is the promise of the spirit of Elohim in us. We saw that as part of the renewed covenant. Having Elohim's spirit or nature is what helps us change from who we are into what he is. Yeshua says this, Yeshua answered him, If anyone loves me, he shall guard my word, and my Father shall love him, and we shall come to him and make our stay with him. Keep that in the back of your mind. The one guarding his commands stays in him, and he in him. And by this we know he stays in us by the Spirit which he gave us. 
the nature, the character. And we are witnesses to these matters, and so also the set-apart spirit, whom Elohim has given to those who obey him. Now we get a condition on receiving said spirit, obedience. And it doesn't mean to the law of the land. Let's actually break down John 14, because we, I've quoted from John 14 there. It's an amazing passage. Let's actually look at some of it. If you love me, you shall guard my commands. So like we just covered, the spirit in Acts 5 is given to those who obey him. If you love me, you shall guard my commands. And I shall ask the Father, and he shall give you another helper to stay with you forever. So Yeshua agrees, or rather Peter agrees with Yeshua. If you love me, you'll guard my commands. Then I shall ask the Father to give you another helper to stay with you forever. The spirit of the truth, whom the world is unable to receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, for he stays with you. This is pre Pentecost, you know, Acts chapter 2, the spirit of truth, he stays with you and shall be in you. How is the spirit of truth already with them? That's what Yeshua has just said it. Right. Yeshua said to him, this is earlier in the chapter, by the way, I am the way, the truth, the life, the spirit of truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. And notice how he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. How is Yeshua the life? The living words, which are spirit. I speak, my words are spirit, and the spirit gives life. Stephen says, the words that the messenger gave, the living words. You can see how all these things start connecting together. So... The spirit of truth, he's with you right now, but he shall be in you. He shall be in you. I shall not leave you orphans. I am coming to you. People will say that this is speaking of Yeshua's second coming. I would argue it's to do with the coming of the spirit, as we will see. Yet a little while and the world no longer sees me, but you shall see me because I live and you shall live. Why? Because you have his spirit inside of you. I don't cover that, I'll be honest. <laughs> in that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Look, he's saying, I'm not going to leave you orphans. The Spirit of truth will come to you. He who possesses my commands and guards them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I shall love him and manifest myself to him. How is he doing this? His nature, his spirit inside of us. Yehuda, not the one from Keriot, so not Iscariot, said to him, Master, what has come about that you are about to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Yeshua answered, if anyone loves me, that he's telling you why. If you love me, you shall guard my word. The spirit is only given to those who obey. And my father shall love him and we shall come to him and make our stay with him. So now is, you've got your sure and the Father in you. Are they literally running around? And, or have you got a third person inside of you? Like, you know, no, you have his nature, his essence, his creative life force. It is through the Spirit that Elohim can manifest himself to us. Look, there's been times I've been stood here and I've watched a teaching back and I'm like, I did not say that. I did not say that. Who, who's saying it? Well, I'm saying it, but I would say that it's the Spirit through me. It is the Spirit that Elohim, through the Spirit, that Elohim can make his stay in us. This is how Elohim dwells in you, his word, his essence, who he is. This is why you start to walk and imitate him and do this thing, this crazy stuff like, you know, keep the feasts and keep Shabbat and turn the other cheek when speak, people speak harshly on you. As an aside, whose spirit is it? I, I really like this. Then Yeshua said to them, this is, he's risen by this time and he's come back to his disciples. Peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. 
And having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the set-apart spirit. Whose spirit is it? Can you breathe on someone and say, here's the spirit? Who's owning? I really like this. And we've just read that. He says, the spirit of truth stays with you and he shall be in you. And we know that 10 days later, they literally, you know, Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 happens. The spirit is only given to some. You know, uh, Judas, not Iscariot, says, how is it that you are to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? We covered this. It's, what is the reason for not all receiving the spirit? Obedience. And so also is the set apart spirit of Elohim given to those who obey him. So I would argue that you can, I'm not saying judge, but we're not called to judge people, but we are called to inspect fruit, right? I don't, I don't like the fruit you are bearing. I'm not going to take a part in it. That's what we're called to do. Not make a past sentence. There's the difference. Who's, what spirit is running around? We know that the spirit of anti-Messiah is running all amok. The fruit of that is evident. Dissensions, factions, denial. Let's actually look at the passages where the spirit is personified. This is the stumbling block. This is where uh, Christianity and the Trinitarians say, see, the spirit is a person. Let's actually look at this. I shall ask, Yeshua personifies him. He shall give you another helper to stay with you forever. Um, the spirit of truth whom the world is unable to receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him for he stays with you and shall be in you. Yeshua has clearly personified the spirit. And he does it in the next chapter. When the helper comes whom I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who comes from the father, he shall bear witness of me. He Right, this is personified. See, right there, the spirit's a person. Job done. In actual fact, in Greek, uh, the translators often translate the spirit as being he, uh, just as he can be translated as it. Mm. It can be translated it. it. I'd say it's a bit of a weak argument on that alone, but let's actually look, you know, because... There's other places it's personified. Yeshua is not the only one. Let's remember that Yeshua equated the spirit in us as having him and the Father making their stay in us. That's what he actually said. By him, through the spirit, we shall make our stay in you. So now you've got three people running around in you. And the one who loves me shall be loved by my father and I shall love him and manifest myself to him. And again, we shall come to him and make our stay with him. Yeshua was a Jew, right? Let's, we can all admit that, right? He was a Jew. A very common and Jewish Hebrew trait is to personify the abstract. So let's personify an abstract idea. Scripture is full of these. And I'm just going to give you like a few to kind of prove a point. Let's look at literally just a few. And Yah said to Cain, why are you wroth and why is your face, your face fallen? If you do well, is there not acceptance? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and it's desires for you, but you should master it. Is sin this like creature, like Gollum, crouching at the door? No. It's, it's an idiomatic phrase, right? Sin here is personified. Proverbs 7, this is the first one people think of usually. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding a close friend. So wisdom is your sister now, understanding is a close friend, to guard you against a strange woman, against a foreigner who flatters with her words. Again, like not, we, not only do we have wisdom personified, but the strange woman. It wasn't literally talking on the Peshat understanding, yes, uh, watch out for any strange women, foreign women that might lead you astray, but it, this is spiritual adultery. No, no, it is the right chapter because Proverbs 8. Yeah, I know. Oh, I might have got the chapter wrong then. <laughs> Does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? Or on the top of the heights along the way between the paths she has taken her stand? Is wisdom literally standing somewhere going, Oi! Beside the gates leading to the city at the entrance, she shouts, 
O oh, men, I call to you, and my voice is to the sons of men. Is there a literal woman standing there? No, it's a personification of an abstract idea. Ezekiel 16, again the word of Yah came to me, saying, Son of man, make known to Yerushalayim her abominations. And say, thus said the master Yah to Yerushalayim, your origin and your birth are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water for cleansing, and you were not rubbed with salt at all, nor wrapped in a cloth. He's personifying Jerusalem here as a small baby. And then the woman grows up, and eventually, therefore, O whore, hear the word of Yah. He's personified Jerusalem and Israel as a whore. Go read the whole passage, it's pretty graphic. Go read Ezekiel 23. <laughs> the, the, the men, uh, we were having, uh, li, li, yeah, it's, it's, uh, as Jez says, it sounds like penthouse, you know, <laughs> how um, Israel played the harlot. Now, is Israel, is there literally a woman running around as the personification of Israel? No. In Luke chapter 16, and would I, this is Yeshua speaking, would I say to you, make friends for yourselves by... Make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they shall receive you into everlasting dwellings. Mammon was the personification of wealth and uh, like materialism. If therefore you have not been trustworthy in the unrighteous mammon, who shall entrust you to the true? No servant is able to serve two masters, for either he shall hate the one and love the other, or he shall cling to the, the one and despise the other. You are not able to serve Elohim and Mammon, possessions, worldly goods. Again, is there this being running around as, you know, the, the, the god of wealth? This is one of the best ones. It's really clear cut. And one of the seven messengers who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come, I shall show you the judgment of the great whore who's sitting on many waters. And the woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup filled with the abominations and the filthiness of her whoring. And upon her forehead was a name, a secret, Bavel the Great, the mother of the whores and of the abominations of the earth. Now, it doesn't matter who you think that is, it's not a literal woman. No matter what your viewpoint on this, it's a personification of an abstract idea, right? Doesn't matter your viewpoint. In all the examples shown, an abstract idea is personified. Scripture is filled with them. That's just a small selection, by the way. You, it, Babylon, the city, Israel, it speaks of the house of Judah and the house of Israel as two sisters. In the same way, the spirit of Elohim is personified. Let, let, let's, let, let's lay aside all our preconceived ideas that we've inherited from our fathers, right? This does not make it a person in its own right. It doesn't make it like, it does, it's not this thing with its own ontology. It's the spirit of Elohim, like the words of Michael, the breath of Michael. It's the spirit of Elohim. It's the word of Elohim. That, that one, when I was thinking, I was like, oh my goodness, this is huge. The word of Elohim, it, it came forth from him. The idea that the spirit is its own person actually didn't come until the 4th and 5th centuries. We'll do this more when we cover the history of doctrines next week, of how these doctrines evolved and came about. It's a Roman Catholic doctrine. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter your view on prophecy. Roman, go look at what Catholicism has done, right? It's not fun. <laughs> let's, just, let's actually assume, right? Let's play a game. Let's assume the spirit is its own person and let's start plugging that definition into a few passages and see what happens. It actually gets quite funny. But the birth of Yeshua Messiah was as follows. And after his mother, Miriam, was engaged to Yosef, before they came together, she was found to be pregnant from the set-apart spirit. If the spirit is its own person, is the father the father? Who's the father? 
But if the spirit is its own person, Yah is not the father. Because Yeshua is the son. The son of who? The son of Yah. Who's the father? By the way, the idea, the idea of God sleeping with women, what does that sound like? Just saying. The parallel passage of this actually gives us the answer to this conundrum. It's not a conundrum. Would you just read? In the sixth month, the messenger Gabriel was sent by Elohim to the city of Galil named Nazareth to a maiden engaged to a man whose name was Yosef of the house of David. And the maiden's name was Miriam. And the messenger said to her, do not be afraid, Miriam, for you have found favor with Elohim. That, that word, it says you have found grace. <laughs> And see, you shall conceive in your womb and shall give birth to a son and call his name Yeshua. And Miriam said to the messenger, how shall this be since I do, do not know a man? The messenger answering said to her, the set apart spirit shall come upon you and the power of the most high shall overshadow you. For that reason, the set apart one born of you shall be called son of Elohim. Again, this classic, the set-apart spirit shall come upon you, the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. This is classic Hebrew poetry. Like, it's like a, an oratory style, almost. The power of Elohim is the set-apart spirit. Gavriel is telling you. Again, note the Hebrew poetic style. The spirit was understood to be the creative power. Look, Elohim is going to create a virgin that's not known a man, to have life in her. Well, what's the best thing to do, the thing that created life in the first place? By his spirit, right? Is now some third other person running around and impregnating Mary. The spirit of El has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Okay, let's look at Acts chapter 2. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Yoel. So Peter's quoting Joel. And it shall be in the last day, says Elohim, that I shall pour out my, my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And also on my male servants and on my female servants, I shall pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. How is a person poured out upon people? Acts 28. And some indeed were, this is Paul, he's just been speaking to a bunch of people. Some indeed were persuaded by what was said, but some believed not. And disagreeing with one another, they began to leave. After Shaul had spoken one word, the set apart spirit rightly spoke through Yeshayahu, Isaiah the prophet, to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you shall hear, but by no means understand, and seeing you shall see, but by no means perceive. For the heart of this people has become thickened, and with their ears they heard heavily, and they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn back, and I should heal them. Is this a person other than Yah speaking through Isaiah? If you read it, it doesn't say, the original in Isaiah, it doesn't say anything, you know, about the spirit per se, but Paul is saying that it was the spirit, the, the Holy Spirit, that was speaking through Isaiah. So, whose prophet is Isaiah? He's Yah's prophet. No one else is. This is problematic if you now have multiple personages in the Godhead. Acts 20, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the set-apart spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the assembly of Elohim, which he has purchased with his own blood. So we covered this last week. It's Elohim that purchased with his own blood. That's huge. But look, the set-apart spirit made you overseers. Is the spirit now in charge of everything? If it's a different person, whose assembly is it? Do you see, when you start plugging in this own person, this different person, it, it, now you, get, you can understand why Jews reject the Trinity. Or did Elohim simply reveal his will just like he did with all the prophets? 
The disciples had the Ruach, so Yah was able to speak through them and say, this guy's your leader, that guy's your leader. If you read, how was Stephen? Uh, It says that, uh, you know, the disciples couldn't wait tables. They had to go do, so we're going to appoint people that are filled with the set apart spirit. How did they come with that decision? Well, they had the mind of Elohim. They understood his word. They had his character. So they were able to make decisions based on that. Again, whose assembly is it? It's Yah's assembly. In the book of Acts, you will find quite often actually things like the Spirit said. And you'll find it a lot. I'm I'm not going to go through them. The Spirit said. Are the apostles now following and listening to a different person? Think about that. Whose assembly is it? Whose authority are they under? Again, this poses problems with the whole Yeshua Yah thing. Whose assembly is it? Who's God? Or is the Spirit simply the means by which Yah communicates to his faithful followers? Right. Go read uh, in the Old Testament of how the prophets operated. It was through the Spirit. Whose prophets are they? It's the same thing going on here. When the Spirit spoke to the apostles, who's speaking? A different person? Or is it Yah speaking through his spirit? Again, we can attest to this. When we know we've not heard the voice literally booming from heaven, we know he's speaking through his spirit. Who's speaking? Yah. Plugging in the definition of the spirit, being another person into such passages will make them make no sense. I'm only, I've only took a few Because I could go on and on and on. And it starts getting, dare I say, a little ridiculous. The way the apostolic writings talk about the spirit actually enforce the unity of Elohim. When I was going through this, I was like, this actually enforces, it, it ratifies his unity. It has to. They also make it very, very clear that Yeshua is divine. What do I mean by that? If we couple the, Old Test- uh, the, the apostolic writings with the Tanakh regarding the spirit, it makes Yeshua Yah himself. So the Tanakh speaks of Elohim's spirit, right? And we, spe- we see a lot of the spirit in the New Testament. Now, wh- wh- as we're going to see, if you couple these together, it makes Yeshua Yah himself. It, it, it makes Yah one. Let, let's see... So in the Tanakh, whose spirit is it, right? It's Yah's spirit, the spirit of Elohim. Now, read through Tanakh, there's only one Elohim, Yah. So what do we do with these verses? And because you as sons, you are sons, Elohim has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Whose spirit is it? What did Yeshua say earlier? That it is the means by which we will make our stay in you. Whose spirit is it? First Peter 1. Concerning this deliverance, this salvation the prophets have sought out and searched out, prophesying concerning the favor for you, in searching to know what or what sort of time the spirit which was in them was pointing out concerning Messiah when it was bearing witness beforehand the sufferings of Messiah and the esteems that would follow. Look at how it says, the spirit which was in them pointing out concerning Messiah. This is the ISR translation, right? The ISR is literally on its own in regards to this rendition. Every other English translation says something different. Every single one. And I'm not a Greek connoisseur, but when I'm looking at it... it, it, You'll see what I mean. This is the Young's literal translation, and it's pretty much bang on with the King James on this and many others. Concerning the salvation, which salvation seek out and search did the prophets, who concerning the grace toward you did prophesy in searching out in regard to what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, the spirit of Messiah, was in them, was manifesting, testifying beforehand the sufferings of Messiah, of Christ, and the glory after these. Every, and I mean every other translation regards this as the spirit of Messiah. 
It will say the spirit of Christ. What's the Greek, right? The ISI is, I think they've missed the boat on this one a little. Go look it up for yourself. The spirit, whose spirit is it? Is Peter now departing from the faith once delivered to him? Is he worshipping a different God? This means that the Ruach of Elohim in the Tanakh is the Ruach of Messiah. Peter's saying it was the spirit of Messiah that the prophets were speaking through. <laughs> How do you deal with that? This is why I say this teaching can be, it either forces you to accept it or it makes you th- rip out your New Testament. This is only possible if Yeshua is Yah. Well, oh wait, he is. He's the word. He can't be. Uh, let, let's well, I'll cover this next week, actually. I will cover this next week. Again, it's to do with how the doctrines evolved between the first and fifth centuries. It's really interesting when you trace it. Romans 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the matters of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the matters of the spirit. We just went earlier, you know, what does it mean to walk in the spirit? For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Again, complete concurrence. You know, my words are life and spirit, the living words. Because the mind of the flesh is enmity towards Elohim, for it does not subject itself to the Torah of Elohim. Neither indeed is it able, and those who are in the flesh are unable to please Elohim. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of Elohim dwells in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, this one is not his. Is there now two spirits within you? Remember what I said about this Hebrew poetical style, this literary, you say the same thing twice, but uh, but in different ways? Paul is, take Paul at face value. The spirit of Elohim is in you, and if if that spirit of Messiah is not in you, you're not his. You have to be intellectually honest with what, at least with what Paul's saying. Shaul is equating the spirit of Elohim to the spirit of Messiah, as did Peter. Is there now two spirits running around? Yeshua said, how is it that it's one spirit through which both make their stay in you, right? Not two separate spirits. He he said the spirit of truth, not the spirit of the spirits of truth. Are there now two holy spirits running around? Again, I ask, whose spirit is it? There is one Ruach, one, not several, one. One set apart spirit. There is one Elohim. This is the Shema. Shema Yisrael Yehovah Eloheinu Yehovah Echad. There is one. Jews will repeat, they, they recite this three times a day to this day, and they did so back then. Did Peter, did Paul, did all these people depart from the faith that was given to them? Did they suddenly start worshipping more than one person? I will ask the question again that I asked in part two. Should a created being receive worship? I don't think so. Only Yah deserves worship. Yah alone. Only Yah deserves worship. If there's more than one Yah, there's problems. If there's more than one spirit, again, the New Testament, the apostolic writings is pretty clear on what it says. I hope that's been a blessing. I I hope at least it's challenged you. I know today was a... I, I didn't... I purposely took a few bits and I've take what you've been given and go and look it out for yourselves. Because of the examples I've given, there's plenty more. I've only given you a snapshot. Go and look at it for yourselves. I hope today's been a blessing.